So we do have some uh, So uh, we have a couple of mics on the side also, so if it gets to the point where we have questions, we're going to probably want to put the mics in front of your voice so that those who are uh, watching the live stream or later watching the recording can hear what the questions are, because sometimes the questions come with comments <coughs> that are very germane to what we're talking about. Um, but it's always good to know what the question was about once the, uh, once the response uh, comes to it. Um, <clears throat> this evening's program is kind of the, the high point of the conference. It's uh, an opportunity for us to hear from our special guest from the United Nations uh, and also um, to hear again from um, Dr. Andrew Conte who spoke earlier today and has a new dimension to add to, uh, to his comments about uh, human rights. And we have a third speaker um, who I am looking forward to meeting for the first time as soon as I set eyes on him. Um, and that's Tupac Enrique Acosta. Uh, and he will be speaking of human rights issues related to indigenous populations in our own country. And it's a very poignant topic as well. So tonight we're, uh, we're hearing from three individuals who have uh, spent very significant uh, periods of their professional life engaged uh, with issues of human rights, with the challenges that surround the efforts to respect and protect and to heal wounds that are caused by um, attacks on the human rights of individuals. Um, John Victor Colo, um, has 30 years of accomplished professional experience. And if you were to look at his vita, you would see that this is very high level engaged uh, work that he has done. Uh, he's served in very important spokesperson roles, which means that he was there framing the, the message of, um, of efforts to, uh, to bring uh, attention and awareness and action to bear on uh, very, very challenging situations that human populations find themselves in. And he'll speak tonight um, from the standpoint of his experience and, and his, uh, his life uh, uh, as an African who has uh, been acutely uh, engaged with the problems of Africa, but has also uh, had his eye on other areas of the world and has been able to, uh, to watch our own country um, from the time that he has certainly been serving with the United Nations. Um, his talk on the impact of irregular migration and forced displacement, uh, the impact of this on peace, security, and development in Africa um, is a topic which affects uh, our world as well. And so I, I threw in a little element there because I feel like our own peace and security is as much uh, under challenge by the conditions and circumstances in Africa and in other areas of the world uh, as, um, as it probably has been at any time in our history. And so I think um, if he doesn't talk about it up front in his talk, we will uh, probably have some questions for him about the impact of, of his observations on how we might be viewing our own relationship to these problems. Uh, so let me introduce and welcome uh, John Victor and Colo. Thank you, thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the faculty, the colleagues, the students who are here. I, am, I really feel privileged to be here tonight. And um, I would very much like to thank Dr. Conte. Thank you for your camaraderie and uh, your friendship. Uh, 
this is a very important subject to me because before joining the United Nations, I was a war correspondent. So I used to travel on foot, sometimes with people migrating from one point to the other, traveling on foot with the Eritreans People's Liberation Front when they were fighting against the Doug regime of Mengistu Ali Mariam and uh, moving uh, through uh, the Sahara or the, uh, the desert in uh, Sudan, crossing through uh, border posts at night, uh, Suakin, and, and watching migration or irregular migration for sound. So we will start by really question of definition. So you have this, uh, uh, this paper where you have what is irregular migration? So, uh, so I'm not going to come back on that, just to say that what some will actually define as irregular migration could be defined by others as regular or as an existential, an existential necessity to survive, which legitimize the move. But before we address the irregular migrations of today as they affect peace, security, and development in Africa, I would like to say that the African people, maybe more than any other people, have been migrating a lot, all the time. It is still not explained why Negroid art was found in pre-Columbian Latin America. Nobody knows exactly why. And you know that uh, in, 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 in the minds of most people, humankind was possibly born in Africa. You heard about Lucy, you heard about Afarensis, you heard about others. So it could well be that Africa may well be the mother of all continents. And in the migrations that are more recent, we can take the migration through the transatlantic slave trade where millions of African women, men, and children were enslaved and taken to the Americas and elsewhere for the triangular trade. And this is migration. And it was not legal in most instances, but for some people it was illegitimate. So what was legal or illegal then may have been Illegal or legal? Legit or not legit? So a few months ago, I gave a lecture in Kolkata, in uh, Bengal, in India, and I asked people to look at each other in the room, a room like this. So they were asking, why is this guy asking us to look at each other? I said, don't you see that most of you are actually Africans? It is a non-comfortable truth in India because the influence of the Sidi people, those who migrated from Africa, not toward the Americas, but actually toward that other land that Christophe, Cristobal Colon, Columbus actually thought he was going to the Indias. There are actually Africans who migrated to Asia. And uh, the Sidis had a big influence on Indian culture, on how you put together an army, how you rule an army, on architecture, on, 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 on cooking, food, and, and playing music. As I'm a music critic, I will always say, listen to the music, just like I'm from New York, they say follow the money. But when it comes to migration, I'll say, listen to the music, and you will see the regular and irregular migration through music. And we'll come back to that. But let us come back to irregular migration as it comes from Africa or as it affects Africa. You see, there are places in Africa, or there is a region that they call the Great Lakes region of Africa. But there are many other lakes. Have you heard about Lake Chad? You know Lake Chad, right? It's a big lake, huge. Now, Lake Chad is somewhere between Cameroon, Nigeria, Niger, Central African Republic is a bit further up there, but it's a big lake. But we can talk about irregular migration. We all know the root causes of these migrations. War, 
injustice, problem of governance. Many people from north and south, western Cameroon are now fleeing their homes, going places. Internal displaced, internally displaced people or people migrating to Nigeria. But when it comes to Lake Chad, we now have a phenomenon in that area called Boko Haram. Boko Haram, these are two words that come from a local slang based on, I will say, Arabic. Boko means book and Haram means forbidden. And these people are determined to stop people going to school. That's actually what the word Boko Haram means. Education, or Western education as we know it, is forbidden. And why is it that Boko Haram is important in the irregular migration? And where do they come from? And why is it that a town in Cameroon called Kolofata, on the other side of the Nigerian border, is regularly attacked? And in one single attack, a couple of years ago, there were 7,000 kids, 7,000 fighters, who joined Boko Haram to go and attack a town. Where does a movement like Boko Haram find 7,000 people? And how do they convince 7,000 young men, some of whom are not older than these kids I see here? How do they manage to convince them to join them and go and kill people and force people not to go to school and rape women? Because of climate change. And I will explain. Lake Chad was a very huge lake, a big lake. I'm from Cameroon, so I can tell. There are two rivers flowing into Lake Chad. One is called the Logon, and there, there's another river called the Shari. Well, about 20, 25 years ago, these two rivers were known as some of the most fertile rivers in northern Cameroon. You couldn't find in the world a river with that amount of fish Actually, people will walk in the mud on the Logon River and catch fish, just catch the fish. So Lake Chad will provide a lot for people. People were living well. It was a wealthy area. Then the lake started shrinking. The effect of climate change, cutting the trees in the northern part of the Sahel, the Sahara coming south, and the Sahel with the Amatan going north, Lake Chad shrinking. With the diminution of that livelihood from Lake Chad, it, was, it became very easy for a movement like Boko Haram to go and check with young men and say, oh, you don't have a school, you don't have food, come with us. We'll give you an AK-47 and we'll give you $2 every month and we'll have some action. And I bet you, if you go to a village and you see young men and they've done nothing with themselves over the past, what, two or three years, and there is no school, and there are no facilities, no electricity, no running water, nothing, and you are called Boko Haram, or whatever you are called, you give them some action, they will probably follow you. So, just like in the Darfur, the scarcity of water created bitterness between the local chiefs, between the Zagawa, the Fur people, and so on, exactly, in Lake Chad, the scarcity of livelihood, of what was giving people food and activity, Lake Chad became the source of a conflict. If you only address Boko Haram with weapons, with military and so on, you are not going to succeed. So peace and security in the Lake Chad area and the transformation of these societies. When the conflict will end because no condition is permanent, you will still have to rebuild. You will have to protect Lake Chad. Because if Lake Chad continues to reduce in size, if rivers disappear, if villages can no longer be there, well, you'll find people from Lake Chad here, here in Turlock. They will walk. If they need to cross the sea, they will. If they need to walk across the Sahara, they will, simply because Lake Chad will no longer be there. So that is a net consequence of climate change. And you can save Lake Chad by building trees, by making sure that those who exploit and export wood, timber, stop or do it properly. So this is a long-term and a very challenging proposition. But let me explain 
that irregular migration is not always something negative. Migration, actually, is something sometimes quite positive. So you have this chart here. It is on purpose that I said I wouldn't like to somehow put them on the screen. But it is good, I think, for students to have this so that at least you can keep this. You can check the source, which is the International Organization for Migration, Global Migration Data Analysis Center, that is based in Berlin. If you go onto the website, you'll find all these maps on migration. Something I want to say about migration is that just look yourself as at the figures, the data that is there. There has been more intra-African migration, regular and irregular, than migration outside of Africa. That's the first truth. The second truth is that African countries are more generous, are more law-abiding when it comes to international norms, when it comes to being the guardian to your brother, to your neighbor, then all these Western countries, if you go and check the number of migrants who are accepted in this country, or irregular migrants who are handled in Europe, you will see that Uganda alone, the country of Uganda alone, has more than one million migrants on its own. One million. In my country, Cameroon, I was born in a place called New Bell, Lagos Market in Douala. It's a shanty town, big shanty town in Douala. At the time already, that was more than six years ago, <laughs> there were millions of Nigerians living in Cameroon. And there are still millions of Nigerians living in Cameroon. Cameroon has a population of about 24, 25 billion. And it is estimated that there are about 4 million legal Nigerian residents in Cameroon. That's one in five. What would be the number of migrants in this country if you had one in five people as migrants? In Cameroon, one nationality only, Nigerians, about four million. And they live in peace. That's why I was born in a neighborhood called Lagos Market in Douala. Because only Nigerian traders. And they have been living there in peace. And there has been no problem. And nobody gave them visas to come. I once worked in Monrovia. I was residing at Mamba Point. And I was preparing for the return of Charles Taylor back into Monrovia. And every morning, I'll go to the beach. I saw in Monrovia at Mamba Point what I saw two, two years ago in a place called Grand Popo in Benin. Ghanaian fishermen, they migrate every morning. About a thousand people strong, an entire village migrating from the coast of Ghana all the way down, fishing. They move every morning. They pull the nets from the river. Fishermen go early in the morning at four, about one kilometer off to the sea. And then they start pulling. Women serve water, or they play music, and they dance, they migrate. They migrate like two or three miles every morning, and they keep on going. And that irregular migration is powerful because it sustains economy. It gives people food. It keeps alive a community organization where people actually feel useful. They dance together, and while dancing, they work, and then, they transform the fish right away. During the night, they smoke the fish. And when the morning is ready, that fish is on canoes. And you will find the fish two days later in Lagos Market in Douala. Dry fish from Ghanaian fishermen. It has been like that for centuries. Migration is something that is in the DNA of African people. It will not stop. What should happen now is that the policies of today should take into consideration the fact that migration is in the DNA of African people. So you can build all the walls that you want. You will still find people today crossing the Sahara. They wouldn't mind. They know that some will be lost on the way, but they know that some will make it. You will have people crossing the seas. They know that many will be lost 
But they know that is how Lucy worked. That's how Afarensis worked. Afarensis is actually the name that was given to one of the first female found, one of the first human beings from the Afar and the Isas, two of the main tribes in Djibouti, who actually fought a bitter war because of scarcity of water, because the resources that are afforded by modern nature to the Afar people and the Isa people are limited. Now, these resources, a long time ago, it was mainly water, but also grazing field. And today, these resources have changed. It's now a seaport in Djibouti, whether it is controlled by the Chinese or by others. One statement that was made by American diplomacy over the past few days in Africa was to complain about the Chinese taking over and making Djibouti a very important platform for business and trade. So I say that natural resources, not only mineral resources, actually fuel irregular migration. And the control of that can stop war or reconstruct the country. It's a double-edged sword. It depends how you use it. Take Somalia. Why is the conflict in Somalia not ending? Why are Somalis found as the f cannon fodder of irregular migration? Because of a triangular trade within Somalia. There are some who control grazing fields, some who control water, and some who have the cattle to sell to the Gulf states. But you cannot control the tree together. So the Hawadli will fight against Habkadi for control. It will only end when the three understand that the triangle is something that you can share. Sharing is not always something that we human beings know how to do. So people will leave their village, people will leave their country only when they are forced to. Somalis are migrants, but you do not love your country more than Somali people love their country. This is the country of poets, country of very proud people. Somalis love Somalia, have covered the war in Somalia, and it is really remarkable. So when we speak about this notion of irregular or regular migrations, we should know that not only do you find Africans everywhere, you find them in the Ottoman Empire as people, Turk, Turkish people love to have, to have a, an eye, to keep uh, an eye on the princesses, on the harem, and, and, and on, uh, in the palaces, because they were good workers. You are now going to have a very important conference in Marrakesh. In next December, heads of states and government are coming together in Marrakesh to, to adopt a landmark uh, global compact on safe, orderly, and regular migration. It is quite interesting that they meet in Marrakesh. Why? Because in my view, Marrakesh represents a lot in the field of migration. Marrakesh is in Morocco. Morocco is the most Western country of the Muslim world. There is no Muslim world west of Morocco in the world. And Marrakesh is very central. And Marrakesh in the local slang means Marrakesh. It was an oasis before, just a few palm trees and some fresh water. So they, because they didn't want to, to share the fresh water, they will tell travelers, migrants, don't stop here. Just keep on walking. Otherwise, we'll chop your head off. So it became Marrakesh, Marrakesh. What happened is that migrants, already at the time, from the Gold Coast, from Ghana, came and settled. They called them the Ginawa, and they play Ginawi music, which has an influence not only on Moroccan music, but also took influence from the Ottoman Empire. Because people of Arab origin, who now populate Northern Africa, were never there. They also migrated. That part of the world was populated by Berber people. So you have the Berber, the Ginawa, Arab people, and you even had some African-American, like Randy Weston, who lived in Tangiers, who died two weeks ago in New York, and who lived in Morocco and who played Ginawa music. So all these heads of state are going to meet in Marrakesh in December. They should stop and try to digest what Marrakesh means. Marrakesh is today really what Marrakesh 
was centuries ago. But then, because people of centuries ago were a bit more tolerant, it was not like in all these European countries where, or American countries where, it not suffice to bash the immigrants and you get voted into power. Really, it created a city and a culture. Any one of you who has been to Marrakesh will know what it means to go to the Jama Elfna. It's one of the big square where snake charmers, uh, Ginawa dancers, people who sell perfumes and so on, excel in making the community a small global village. So, if you think of the cities in India, you think of Brazil being a place where you will find millions of people of African origin because of the slave trade. You think of Quebec, Quebec. Irregular migration allowed Quebec in Canada to have its name because Jacques Cartier had on his boat a traveler, an irregular migrant, a Caribbean, who was of African origin, but nobody knows why he knew so many languages. So when Jacques Cartier arrives on the shores of what we now call Quebec City, <laughs> the local population there come and say, who are you, where are you coming from? And he tried to explain who he is. But then there is this guy who is of African origin who is translating for him. And then Cartier asks him, what are these people telling me? What do they want? What, what, what should I do? And this translator tells Jacques Cartier, well, they are saying Quebec, which means you are welcome to set foot on the shore. Come in. That's how the name Quebec comes. But that name, Jacques Cartier could only have known if he had an irregular migrant aboard his ship who was able to translate. Jacques Cartier could not know a language spoken by the people who are the first, the first nations in Quebec and in Canada. So when you turn irregular migration, or migration for that matter, on its head and you read it that way, you understand how beautiful and how positive it can be. It can also be tragic, to be honest. When Columbus arrives in what is today Haiti and the Dominican Republic, he is stunned by the beauty and intelligence of a wonderful woman called Anna Kauna, the local princess or queen. She's beautiful. She's something that a European sent by Queen Elizabeth, the Catholic queen from Spain, have never seen. And then she's tricked into some kind of uh, terrible uh, deal, and she's killed. And uh, it becomes very tragic. And I will suggest that Haiti, up to this day, even though they fought hard and they defeated the French, they are still paying the price of the encounter between an irregular migrant called Jacques Cartier, who arrived on the shores of uh, Hispaniola and met Anna Kauna, and they wanted to bring some goods, some gold, and some beauty back to Spain to show Queen Isabel that they did well. But that is also part of a migratory uh, exchange. So think of Haiti. In terms of migration, it is the only country whose constitution will allow a migrant, regular of, or irregular, of African origin to settle in Haiti without question ask. Haiti has that provision. And that is why the African Union has now a very important resolution that will make the diaspora and countries of the CARICOM, the Caribbean, its sixth region. And there is now a very important strategic thinking to link the 54 countries of Africa within the African Union to the diaspora, to that other part of Africa that is in the Caribbean. And that is very important. Therefore, the whole question of migration becomes very important because whether you are a regular migrant or irregular migrant, Western Union doesn't care. They'll still take your money and send it to Africa. 
irregular migrants send more money to the African continent than all foreign aid and ODA put together. Let me repeat that again. Irregular migrants send more money to Africa than all the Bretton Woods institutions, all the overseas development aid, all foreign aid put together. This is something that has to be taken into account. So even irregular migration can have a good name, even when it comes to money and capitalism. I would like us to have more time to discuss some of these ideas, but I would like now to discuss an area that is very close to me, which is music, which I believe is extremely important. If you really care for this country, for America, think of what America brings to the world in terms of positive thinking, sharing, humanity. It's usually it's the arts, it's music, it's jazz, what Randy Weston called African rhythms. And where does it come from? The Congolese rumba. You can name Rochero, Taboule, Fali Ipupa, uh, all kinds of big Congolese musicians, Pepe Kale, Kofi Olomide. The Congolese rumba was influenced by music from Hawaii. You had Hawaiian guitars on slave ships going to the African West Coast, and African orchestras, African bands, like the one in Guinea, the Bemea Jazz, Bemea Jazz National, play better rumba and better salsa than bands in Cuba. And the Congolese rumba is influenced by the Hawaiian guitar. So when you listen to Njunju music by Sir Victor Owaifo, guitar boy. You are listening to Hawaiian music, the way he plays guitar. Guitar boy, it's, it's how, how. Now, what's the connection between Hawaii, Hawaiian music, and, 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 and Africa? The fact remains that when you start claiming, for instance, that migrants are this and that, you forget that you can have that discussion outside of the economic or political world. You can have a discussion on arts, on music, on all kinds of things. And uh, in terms of uh, the African DNA, having migration in the DNA, Timbuktu was an extraordinary important crossroads. And that's why Boko Haram, or extremist group that are like Boko Haram, attacked Mali and wanted to destroy Tombuktu. And that is why UNESCO was very hard working to restore some of the important monuments in Tombuktu. Because when this country, the United States, was not a country, was just what the First Nations here had, Tombuktu was already a place of learning with university professors, with libraries, Timbuktu was actually a very important point on the migration route. You took caravans who will go across the Sahara and they will stop in Timbuktu and then they'll continue. They'll bring salt, they'll bring gold. Even the Bible has a mention of one of the kings going to Jesus, passing through that route and bringing some presents, some gifts from Africa. So, when you think, when you read books or the writings of Ibn Battuta, the traveler who came north to the south, when you read about the history of Timbuktu, when you read the story of migration in Africa, South Africa, Tipu Tip, going all the way, west and so on, even Cameroon, who are the people who ended up populating Lake Chad? Where do they come from? How are people in Africa have been moving? There had been more migration inside Africa than migration outside of Africa. And you will therefore know that there has always been exchanges between people. And I think that we have to see migrants not as people 
who are poor or rich and so on. We just have to see them as, as human beings. This is why the work of uh, uh, Anne and other people who actually record these personal histories. At the end of the day, it is the human story. It's a human history. Think of migration. What has Chicago, the city of Chicago, has to tell us? Who started Chicago? Who built Chicago? Well, it was an irregular migrant, a Haitian trader and dealer who was established in a place that has now become one of the greatest cities in the world, Monsieur Du Sable. He's the one who started Chicago, and he married one of the First Nation girls. And that is how Chicago has become what Chicago is today, because of somebody from where? from Haiti. And I'll just end it here and tell you the last story. Think about somebody whose grandfather was an irregular migrant and traveled to Haiti. He was an economic migrant. He was on a ship with some of his friends. He was in his late teens or early 20s. When the ship arrived in Haiti, where they were hoping to do some business, the ship fell apart. The ship hit some rocks. People in Haiti then took this man in with his friends. They fed them. They gave them a roof. They treated them well. And they were sent back when they said they want to go back to their own country and they went back to wherever they were coming from. They were coming from Germany. Who was that grandfather who was welcomed by the Haitian? Who was that man? That was the grandfather of Donald Trump. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Do you feel like it's any better than it was before? Do you feel like it's getting worse? Um, do you see any change or progress? So that is a very good question. I left my country, Cameroon, when I was a teenager to go and study abroad. And uh, at the time, it was not easy to get a visa. My visa in France had to be renewed every six months. And I need to present my papers. I need to show that I'm still going to school. And I need to show that I've paid my, my fees and everything. So I need to wake up early in the morning at 4 to be one of the first on the line to renew my uh, residence permit for six months. But today, it seems like at the age of computers, it is far more difficult for a young Cameroonian to get a visa, be it a student visa anywhere in the world. It's very difficult for a young African. So it's complex, but at the same time, it shouldn't be. We live in a global village, and I believe that things have gotten worse. And, and, and it, it really shouldn't be. When I was a war correspondent, I was always, always surprised by the fact that few people were actually prosecuting the war. I mean, those soldiers, the, 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 the young men and women, they didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave the country. And they didn't have a good life. So, you do not leave your country because you are an adventurous person. You leave because it is necessary or because opportunities may not be there in your country. I wanted to be a filmmaker. There was no cinema school in Cameroon. I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker, so I had to go and study cinema in Cameroon, but I th in France. But I think that today it is more difficult because some of the ills some of the trends that showed Africans that Europeans are not worse or better, certainly not better, like all that happened during the World War, like the genocide against Jewish people, 
and others, all these trends may be coming back. You now have a, a trend in Europe where through democracy, people are being voted to power to do exactly this kind of things. And it is very worrying. And you have a country like Italy, and yet Italy is a country that, that lived out of migration. I mean, the Irish people here in the United States can, 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 can speak about that. Where do they come from? Why they came here? And so on. And, 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 and in my own country, we have Lebanese, a very important Lebanese. I still have friends with whom I went to school, the Fotiu and so on, Lebanese and Greek people in Cameroon who have never set foot in Lebanon or Greece. The people who were handling transport in Cameroon in the 50s and 60s are Kumblas. The only car that will take you from Yaoundé to Abongban is the Greek people. The, uh, the, even today, you go and buy bread in, uh, uh, in Yaoundé, there is a chance that it is a Greek person who is holding that, 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 that shop. And yet, African people have always been welcoming. Uh, King Makoko I welcomed Savoyan de Braza, hence the name of Brazzaville. He put together a very large reception with a meal and so on. And de Braza himself has in his company a Senegalese man with whom he was traveling. I mean, you had people from Europe, all over. Apocalypse now is actually based on a story in the Congo. You know, all these people were traveling, coming to Africa, and they've always been welcoming. African people have been traveling. And now the time has come when you have this populism, this nationalism, and so on. But I think it can lead to war. And, and it, is, it is very serious because our resources have to be shared, our intelligence has to be shared, and our dreams have to be shared. Otherwise, we will all be blind and we can lock horns into terrible wars. Thank you. Yes. Most of the examples that you gave tonight from the African continent were more or less from the northern half of Africa. Is there any significant or substantive difference in migration issues, say, in the southern part of the continent and maybe the countries that you didn't address? There is. There is. It is just that because of geography, that northern part of Africa, uh, because Morocco is so close to Europe in Ceuta and Melilla, because Libya has broken down and it is maybe they believe it is easier than other parts. It's just a question of geography. But uh, if you see the, 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 the map on the Africa uh, internal migration, you will see that uh, there is a lot of movement toward South Africa yeah, on, on this map. And there are lots of movement along and around the lakes. And there are actually a lot of movement of people not going toward Europe, but actually going toward other African countries. I told you in Cameroon, lots of Nigerians. Now many, many people coming from the Central African Republic. These people don't want to go to Europe. They actually believe that going to Cameroon is, is better and so on. But the thing here is that really it's about politics. Some mistakes can be made. When you strategize and you say, I want to support Libyans or Libyan entity for doing this or that about migration, and there is no accountability of that, you can actually make the problem worse. But I think uh, CNN had a report some time ago on how African people are being enslaved again in 2017, 2018 in Libya. So somebody is making money. So it means it really hasn't changed. People are still being bought and sold. The real solution the real, to, 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 to really stop this irregular migration based on money, based on traffic, really, is to help governance and to tackle the root causes, to tackle climate change, to tackle governance, to tackle the financial flows. But it is not the African countries that are solely responsible. Take the Congo, Democratic Republic of the Congo. We all have cell phones. Can, can somebody show me 
We have a cell phone. Yeah. You see that cell phone that Anne has in her hands? It's a small equipment. It used to be big, but now she can charge it and she can keep it for two or three days. And she can have, she can take photographs, she can make videos, she can be on social media, she can do all kinds of things. Why? Because there is a mineral in this cell phone called the coltan. And it allows this cell phone to keep and to process more than cell phones of the past. And where do you find this mineral? You only find it in two or three places in the world. And the Democratic Republic of the Congo is the main, the main producer. But it is irregular production that fuels irregular migration and that actually fuels the armies that control the mines in the eastern part of the Congo where they find the coltan. Because we all want to have these new cell phones, these iPads, these flat equipments per, with high performance, we do not realize that unwittingly maybe, indirectly maybe, we are fueling the wars in the Congo because it just takes somebody with a few AK-47 to control a piece of land and send young kids because the younger they are, the smaller they are, the easier it will be for them to go down the mine and to bring a bag of coltan. And then you put that in a truck, it, is, it transits through a neighboring country, they find themselves uh, at an airport in Nairobi or somewhere and it comes to Europe. Same thing for the diamonds. So our way of life here in the West and elsewhere on all these metrics that talk about development, connectivity, whatever, there is a price to pay. I can assure you that there is a part in the industry connected to cellular phones and such equipment that actually fuel irregular migration and that fuel civil wars. That I know. I've worked in 10 peacekeeping operations and twice I was based in the Congo. Once in Mugunga, in Goma, after the, 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 the Rwandan genocide, and I, I saw how these people operate. And I also worked as the head of office of the UN in the Kasai. That's a diamond producing uh, place. And Chikapa is one of the busiest airports in the world. Not because people go from San Francisco or Paris to Chikapa, simply because small aircraft go there day in and day out and take diamonds and so on. But there is no road in Chikapa. There is no real hospital. There is nothing. I worked there. I was in charge. And uh, I can tell you that some of these minerals, this extractive industry, fuel all kinds of bad things. And the responsibility is here in the West. To have somebody who is corrupt, you need a corruptor also. You have to have somebody else who is accepting to dance the tango. Thank you again for having me. I have a regret that I will not be able to learn more from Dr. Conte and the other speakers because I now have to drive back to San Francisco and catch a flight tonight, migrating back to New York. Thank you.